Actualities of it are based upon transmissions from people who have said, purported to witness these things. And maybe Sheikh Asrar can tell us some more about the reality of awliya as shaitan. With regard to the awliya Allah, you have 40 of Dal in Bilal Sham. There are six, a minimum of six authentic hadith on the Abdal. A minimum. And Al Imam Muhammad bin Ja'far al Thani in the book Nur al Mutanafik in Hadith al Mutawakir, he states that Hadith is Mutawakir, mass transmitted. Today, the Wahhabis they deny the existence of Abdal. That is because they do not have Abdal in their group. Yes, we have Abdal. The Abdal do exist, and they are mainly in Damascus. With regard to Awliya or shaitan, you just need to look at the White House. It's not secret where they are. No offense. <laughs> and in the British Parliament, yes, in the British Parliament, you have shayateen. So their actions, meaning you just need to look at George Bush Jr and some of his actions and his, some of his speeches and then George Bush Sr. without going into other aspects with regard to what these people get up to in their private lives. answered this question in the Quran this is what your hands have brought forth uh, let me tell you something about an amazing thing that was witnessed by uh, an anthropologist now anthropologists the people they study different types of people and they, they like to study the aboriginals the aboriginals are the people who have no connection to the modern world so a guy went to South America and he studied the aboriginals. There are still people today, they've never seen a light bulb. They've never seen electricity. They've never seen, they don't know anything about modern times. 
They don't need, may have heard of it, but they live in the depths of the Amazon rainforest. When he took the pictures home and he had them developed and he started to put them for his magazine publication or book or whatever, he noticed something. He said, all the old men have full head of hair. All the men and women, perfect teeth. And he realized the natural form of the human being is healthy. Then only when he did some research, only the crooked teeth began to develop after the refinement of sugar. And people would consume refined sugars, more sugary food than, natu nat uh, than is natural, then they would develop crooked teeth. And alhamdulillah, Allah created for us dentists and people to give us braces and to solve other problems. But he noticed perfect teeth, perfect hair. So the human being by himself is crisp and clean and healthy. But it's by what our own hands have brought as human beings. So this question, what it leaves out is that Allah also created for you your own willpower. My willpower, his willpower, her willpower. Everyone has their own willpower created by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We do stuff in the world. When a bad thing happens, don't ask what, what happened. Oh Allah, what happened? What happened was disobedience of some sort, excess. We went to excess in the foods that we produced. So we got sick. We went to excess in the food that we consumed. So we got sick. And we put sicknesses all in the world through plastics that we developed that mingle with our food, that mingle with our soap, and is living with us. And so finite, or so, so fine, you cannot possibly detect a change, but the change is happening. And cancers develop and other things develop. When a bad thing happens, always know human action is behind it. But when good things happened, when the cure is created, do you th who do you thank? Right? So the sign of the sickness in a heart is that when a bad thing happens, I say, oh Allah, what happened? When a good thing happens, we forget about Allah. That's not the questioner. I'm just saying that's a general rule. So bad things happen because human beings have willpower. We have will. There's even studies on animals. There are no animals that are ever born deformed except when those animals live amongst humans and consume the food and live in the environment of humans. Then the animal, their babies can maybe come out with deformities. I would say to the questioner that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, aside from being Ar-Rahim and Ar-Rahman, He is what? Wa al-Qahiru fawqa ibadihi. He is the one who overwhelms His servants as well. He is Al-Khafid, the one who lowers. He is Al-Mudhil, the one who disgraces. He is the one who is what? Al-Mumit, the one who gives death. And He also gives illness. So you cannot just take one attribute of Allah in isolation. You need to take into account all the attributes of Allah. Then he is what? فَعَالٌ لِمَا يريد, The doer of what he wills. He does what he wants. لَا يُسْأَلُ عَمَّا يَفْعَلُ وَهُمْ يُسْأَلُونَ he, he is not questioned with regard to what he does. They will be questioned with regard to what they do. Yes, so you need to take all of these things into account. And refer to chapter 4 of my book also, inshallah. Not always, the usul is not 
be, that the philosophy is not that changing an evil begets another evil. No, that, that's not the philosophy. The philosophy is that oftentimes the solutions of certain evils when ushered in by evil people is a worse problem than the actual solution, the, the, than, than the original evil. It's all based upon who's ushering in the solution. Who is ushering in the solution? Because of our ummah and our committing of sins and disobedience, our hands have been tied from being the ones offering the solutions. So a problem arises, who offers the solutions? Forces of evil offer a solution. Their solution is 10 times worse than the problem. So it's not a philosophy that if you change the wrong, it's going to be worse. That's not the case at all. And if you look at uh, the, the, one of the results of an ummah that, ref, that persists in laziness on forbidding the wrong is that there will come a day you will want to forbid the wrong and you can't. You have lost your chance. Is that not an apt description of our ummah today? For years and centuries, the ummah has been going astray from the sunnah. Now that we want to change the wrong, we have no power. In general, a regular individual has very little power to change these big global national scale wrongs. So what we have today is to change the wrongs. You have a sphere of influence and a sphere of concern. Our concern is the whole ummah, but the influence is what you can actually fix, what you physically can do today. So whatever it is, if Allah increases it, then it increases it. But at the moment in time, at this moment in time, what we see is that the general, that the, the, who, is the, who is the actor in the name of the Sharia and the name of the deen at the global level? Who is it? Where is he? He doesn't exist because he needs a population to support him. And those populations aren't there. You're the guest. Uh, what is the uh, measures to protect our young generation? The number one measure has to be a suhba, good companionship with other kids struggling again, and whose families recognize these evils and these ills. Is this one thing when I have to struggle against something by myself, but it's a whole nother feeling when 50 of us believe the same thing. So if you have suhba, if your kids have good friends who also recognize those evils, everything will be a lot easier. So you can't stop these evils from coming into, into our lives. We can maybe limit them, maybe control the environment a little bit, but nobody can change the fact that one day your kid's gonna be on the internet. Nobody can change the fact that one day he'll have a cell phone. What you can do is allow the usage of these devices in, in your homes in a way that does not lend to committing sins. Like what? Like you use it in the kitchen in front of everybody. And you get a big screen. Your computer's big. And your laptop is big. And you're sitting right in the, living, in the kitchen. As opposed to a device that you close the door on your room with. A person and the internet, who was the third? Shaitan. Okay, because the internet's like another person, right? Third one is Shaitan. So you can now hand it in at night in your homes when you have youth and children who have to use these devices. Make the screen big, use it in the general area of the home, right? And then hand it in at 8 p.m. 9 p.m., you bring it in, you bring it into your mom and dad's room. You hand it in. So you, we can have the same devices and same things and same uh, fitan, but you can create a situation where it's easy to be disciplined. Who is the most self-disciplined person? The one who doesn't have to be so self-disciplined. We can create an environment in our homes where the kids have, are going to be with these things, 
but they can they don't have to practice self-discipline there is a culture in the home there's a system in the home the environment helps them not have to discipline themselves it's hard for a kid to practice self-discipline so that's environment and habits that you can create but also the suhba on top of that With regard to uh, the Khilafah, uh, it's an obligation and it's mentioned in all the books of Kalam, Ilmul Kalam. Just check a standard book like Sharhul Aqaid. They mention it's an obligation to Nasbul Imam, to establish an Imam who distributes the zakat and whatnot. There are two extremes with this regard. One is a political frustration of some of the Jama'at and Ahzab, these groups that you have that attempt to establish a khilafah, the, the frustrations that they have. So you have mass imprisonments and torture. In the, the Arab regimes are known for this. They imprison people, they torture them because they call for khilafah. And then you have some people saying that it's not an obligation that it will happen when Imam al-Mahdi radiallahu anh appears, which is contradicting what, what the books of Kalam state. There is a middle path, and that is what I advocate, which is what mentioning the obligation, calling for the obligation, but at the same time safeguarding the Muslims in terms of political oppression. There is, remember, murder and mass imprisonment, as has occurred in Egypt, in Syria, many other places, is not essential to be on the truth. Some people think it's essential. If your group is not being imprisoned, not being tortured, they think these two things go hand in hand. So you look at the likes of Imam Mutawalli al-Sha'rawi, rahimahullah ta'ala in Egypt. He lived in tumultuous times. Yet, he discussed and preached Islam better than any preacher from all those groups. And he was an advocate of Khilafah. Similarly, Al-Imam Muhammad Saeed Ramadan al bouti in Syria, he advocated for Khilafah. To this day, his book on the Khilafah is published in Damascus. Bashar al-Assad has not banned that book, which advocates for Khilafah. So what does that tell you? That it's not always essential to have a clash in order to establish the Khilafah there's a way of lateral thinking which I am advocating, a lateral approach as opposed to the standard Socratic approach. Again, Socrates is not someone we necessarily follow. <laughs> 